Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, Senior Scholar at the Center for Health Security at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Just as she did a couple weeks ago, Dr. Nuzzo has agreed to answer questions that have been coming in about the novel coronavirus. Let's listen. Dr. Nuzzo, thank you very much for joining me. Today, I'm going to ask you some questions that have come in through the email publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. So the first question is, why is the world's response to COVID-19 so much more severe than the response to other outbreaks like H1N1 or SARS? Uh, It's a great question. Um, One thing is that this is a different virus. Uh, What we've learned so far about this virus is that it's more easily transmitted than SARS was. The the epidemic that uh, happened in 2003 was due to SARS. And uh, then we learned that uh, people were um, able to transmit their infection most likely when they were uh, quite ill and not really moving about the community as much. Uh, So a lot of transmission occurred in healthcare environments. Once we were able to improve infection control in healthcare environments, uh, we were able to uh, bring the epidemic under control. Um, H1N1, the 2009 pandemic caused by a new flu strain, H1N1, uh, was uh, similar in the sense that um, cases were able to transmit their infections quite easily, um, but it was a milder virus and it didn't produce the same level of um, severe illness and death that we so far have seen with this uh, novel coronavirus. So in other words, this is contagious like H1N1 or maybe even a little more, but it is um, more deadly than that uh, virus. So it's got the um, contagiousness maybe of H1N1 and yeah. it has the, a little bit of the threat of SARS. So it's sort of this unfortunate combination. Yeah, I mean, it's fortunately, because we're looking for some good news here, it's not as deadly as SARS was. Um, on average, SARS seemed to kill about 10% of the known cases. And um, the estimates for this virus are much, much lower. But um, yes, uh, the fact that it's um, so easily transmissible, much more like a flu than SARS, um, has made response to this pandemic quite difficult. Great. Um, Here's another question. The flu vaccine isn't um, 100% effective. Some years it may be 25%, 50%, 75% effective. Um, Will a vaccine for COVID-19 be more effective than the usual flu vaccine? Yeah, so we don't know what the um, effectiveness will be. We're still uh, doing the studies to see exactly that. Um, that said, if it were uh, to be 50% effective, I would love that. I mean, I would love to have any tool in the toolbox to be able to reduce severe illness and death. And um, that is actually, I think, an important point about the flu vaccine is that even though it doesn't protect as many people from being infected as we would like, um, it does seem to be quite helpful in preventing severe illness and death in people who are uh, vaccinated and who still get the vaccine. So um, definitely get your flu shot every year um, unless, uh, you know, it's, um, it, it is helpful to keep people out of the hospital. Got it. So the um, vaccine may actually be quite helpful, even if it isn't perfect. Exactly. Exactly. The thing, all the measures we're taking right now are trying to keep people out of the hospital. So that would be a huge benefit. Great. Um, a couple of questions have come in about testing. Are you satisfied that the problem of a shortage of testing has been resolved? Uh, no, I'm not satisfied. I think um, we will continue to see an expansion of testing. And with that, we will likely find more cases. But I still know that testing is quite limited in a lot of environments. And I am particularly concerned about hospitals and hoping that uh, doctors and nurses uh, can have access to testing for their patients so that they can make decisions about how to isolate them and how best to treat them. And um, just um, having conversations with people in hospitals, uh, it sounds like it's still quite difficult. Great. Now, here's a related question, which is, as testing becomes more available, and it certainly is becoming more available, 
the number of positive cases will rise. And so the question is, is that going to give people a sense that there's suddenly many more infections or when we're really just counting more infections? And um, how can we assure the public doesn't overreact to that? Right. So we expect that cases will rise and we expect that cases will rise um, because additional transmission is occurring in our communities. Um, hopefully, some of the measures that everybody is now taking to stay home and do other things will reduce that. Um, we should still expect that more transmission will occur. That said, um, when we expand testing, we will find more cases simply because we're um, opening the window uh, that we are using to view what may be happening in our communities that we weren't we previously weren't able to see. So um, I think people should expect that there will be an increase in cases, and that will in part be because of transmission, but also in part because we are trying to um, greatly expand the number of people who can get tested. Thank you. Um, why does COVID-19 cause shortness of breath? Well, COVID-19 um, can cause damage to the lungs that impede their ability to remove uh, oxygen from, from the air. Um, a lot of the patients develop what's known as severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, and they really benefit from having additional oxygen, um, particularly in hospital settings. Those are for the patients who get very sick. They may get the uh, Correct. acute respiratory distress syndrome. But even for people who are mildly ill, um, they may have, uh, or moderately ill, uh, some degree of um, impact on their lungs that could cause shortness of breath. Is that right? Correct. Correct. We're seeing viral pneumonia in um, in even patients who don't even feel that sick. Um, here are some uh, questions. Can you uh, avoid the virus by drinking warm water every 15 minutes? I think that might have been on the internet. Yeah, I've seen this um, kind of meme going around on the internet. I know some relatives have sent it to me. Um, there's no evidence behind that claim. I mean, certainly you want to stay hydrated, uh, but that kind of internet meme that's going around is, telling people that they should only drink uh, warm water um, and that if they drink cold water, their lungs will become fibrotic. And I just want to stress that there's no evidence to support that at all. Great. And that's what you tell your relatives too? Yes. Stay hydrated, but don't worry about drinking cold water. Okay. Um, also related, they're, uh, holding your breath test. There's a holding your breath test sweeping the internet. Um, are you familiar with that? And do you know what? I'm not familiar with that one. Maybe it's that if you can hold your breath and you know that you do or you do not have uh, COVID-19. Um, There's no way to tell if you have COVID-19 um, without a laboratory test, unfortunately. Um, there is actually some evidence that a um, CT scan could provide some um, uh, pictures of your lungs that may raise suspicions. But at this point, the only way we can really tell if you have COVID-19 is um, if, if you get a laboratory test. And I can't say that without following it with a plea that at this point, particularly given that testing is limited, um, we can't have everybody who wants to be tested go out trying to get a test. At this point, we very much have to prioritize those people who are quite ill and to let um, doctors and nurses in hospitals decide who needs to be tested. Um, they can't handle seeing a surge of just anybody who feels like they might be slightly ill showing up trying to get tested. At some point, testing will be expanded and it may very well um, be extended to people who are mildly ill. But at this point, uh, we can't absorb uh, many, many people trying to access healthcare just to be tested. Good point. Okay. Um, so how much food should people have on hand? I think, uh, is there a worry for the food supply at this point? So well, there's no evidence that there's a shortage of food. I think people have gone to the grocery stores and seen some empty shelves, which probably alarms them. I think that's probably more due to just people all going out at once, trying to buy things before the grocery stores have had the ability to restock. Um, that said, I think it makes sense to keep uh, you know, food on hand and to keep it um, so that you don't have to keep going out to the grocery store frequently. Because right now what we're telling people to do is to try to stay home as much as possible to limit your possibility of being exposed to the virus. So if um, you can keep some food on hand to uh, enable you to stay home for longer, I think that's a good idea. Um, great. A couple more questions. Um, a number of people have asked about uh, the elderly, uh, older adults, um, and what the best advice for them is at this point. 
So uh, this is a great question, and I'm, I'm glad it was brought up. Um, adults who are older, um, over the age of 60, so we have the data, are particularly at risk of developing severe illness and death. So above all, um, I mean, it's important for everybody to take measures to reduce their risk of exposure to this virus. Um, but above all, we need to ensure that the people who are most vulnerable to this virus, most likely to wind up in a hospital requiring, uh, you know, aggressive interventions and um, potentially uh, intensive care. Um, above all, we need to make sure that um, we protect these people. And so um, if you are in the age of 60 years older, or if you know relatives or friends who are, please encourage them to stay home as much as possible to limit their exposure to the virus. Because um, if they become ill, they have a greater chance of, of having complications. And um, that's going to put a huge strain on the health system. And we just don't want people to get unnecessarily ill. And so um, what ways could people help individuals who really can't go out that much? They could bring them food. Yeah, so that's a right. Great suggestions. Um, uh, you know, check on your elderly relatives if they need anything. Obviously, wash your hands um, if you are going to be interacting with them. Don't go and see them if you have any kind of symptoms. But um, if we can check on our, our elderly um, relatives and neighbors, and I recognize as I'm saying the world, word elderly and previously said age 60 or older, many people don't see themselves as elderly if they fall in that category. But um, just check on your neighbors and see if they need anything. And if you can support them to enable them to stay home, maybe you can run some errands for them or um, get some groceries for them if they need to, if they need it, and uh, just use all the precautions one would take to um, reduce exposure, like washing hands and staying home if you're sick. Uh, don't go near them if you're sick. Great. Um, last question, but it's a, a big one, which is, you know, there, there are a lot of changes people are seeing out, um, particularly here in the United States. Sports events have been canceled large gatherings have been canceled, meetings have been canceled, travels down in some places, bars and restaurants have been closed. Some places people are being asked to shelter in place. Um, are we overreacting? I definitely don't think we're overreacting. Um, obviously, there are still a number of unknowns about this virus and still an open question is about the severity of this virus. I hope that we somehow discovered that this virus isn't as severe as um, we fear it could be. That said, we have to prepare as though it is. And I think it's incredibly important for us to take actions early in order to reduce the spread so that we can offload from the health system what would otherwise be a potentially crippling number of cases of severe illness. So while it may seem like very unusual circumstances that we find ourselves in, and indeed, um, it is. I don't know of any instance in modern history where we've had to do something like this in the United States. Um, it is very important, but um, you know, I don't think that we should uh, uh, worry about overreacting. We are just trying to take the best actions we can on the data that we have. Data may change, and we may change our approach, and that's some kind of um, flexibility or um, course correction could very well happen. And we should expect um, that if changes are made based on new data, that that's a sign of a, an adaptive and strong and flexible response. But as for now, all data suggests that we are doing the best that we can with the information that we have. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I know how busy you are, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.